In this lesson, we're gonna go through the mechanism of free radical halogenation, and we're gonna find why bromination ends up being more selective than chlorination along the way. We're also gonna find out that radical reactions are just represented and occur differently than our normal organic reactions. And so things are gonna look a bit, little bit different in the mechanisms of our free radical halogenation reactions. Now this lesson's part of my new organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you wanna be notified every time I post one, subscribe to the channel and click that bell notification. All right, so let's take a look at the mechanism of free radical halogenation. It is different than anything you've ever seen here, and we'll represent it differently as well. So instead of a, a linear chain like this turns into this, turns into this, turns into this, we find that we actually present this as like we produce something in one step, and then we're going to use it to do something else in the next step instead of continuing on. And there's going to be a reason for that, as we'll see. And so... Uh, if we take a look, I'm only showing two of the steps. We're going to add four more steps to this, sort of, uh, in a way. But these are the two most important steps because this is where the product is formed. And so, in this case, we're going to do chlorination of methane. Uh, and in this case, we're going to put a chlorine on the only carbon that we have, replacing a hydrogen. It's a substitution reaction. And we can see that this is right where our product is going to be formed right here, in this step right here. And kind of take a look at this. We're going to have a chlorine radical come in. What, so we're going to say it abstracts a hydrogen from methane. So it's going to form a new bond to this hydrogen, causing this one to break, leaving us with a methyl radical. And we're going to form a carbon radical in that first step there. And, and that carbon radical is going to bump into a molecule of Cl2 and bond to one of the chlorines. The other chlorine is going to be left being a radical. And so that chlorine radical we produce in step two along with our product just goes back and finds another methane molecule to react with. And so we just keep repeating these two steps over and over and over and over and over again, zillions of times, producing product every sequence of these two steps. And uh, it turns out when these two steps that repeat over and over and over again to form your product, we call them propagation steps. Now we've got a problem here though, so because here I'm saying we got a chlorine radical to start with. Well, we don't have a chlorine radical to start with. If you look at our reaction here, we'd be, if we drew out that net reaction, it would be methane. We'd hit it with Cl2 and light and we'd form some CH3Cl. So this is how we'd normally just kind of show the net reaction here and stuff like that. And so again, there's our product forming and stuff like that. But notice we didn't start with any Cl radicals. We started with Cl2. And so it turns out before you can do the propagation, you gotta initiate the reaction. And then in the initiation step, your goal is to form the radical that you need to start this sequence of propagation steps that'll just keep repeating and repeating and repeating. And so it turns out in this case, we're gonna take our chlorine-chlorine bond and break it into two separate chlorine radicals. So um, because all we're doing is breaking a bond, this is going to cost energy. And if you've got the handout handy, you see that the delta H for this step is a big fat positive number, it requires a fair amount of energy. And that's why we're gonna either add light as I'm gonna do here, or heat or some peroxide and stuff like that. So because we've got to supply that energy and it turns out the light you use is gonna be light that corresponds to such an energy and things of a sort uh, to get this reaction to happen or the amount of heat you have to use is the amount of heat it takes to break this bond corresponding once again to that delta H and stuff like this. So, but we are gonna to have to initiate this reaction and that's our initiation step. It's the one that gets the radicals formed that we need to do the, uh, the propagation steps. And so as a result, we end up calling this initiation let's see if this one works any better oh yeah i got the wrong blue marker all right all right but that's our initiation step and typically your free radical actions are going to have a single initiation step they're going to be followed by two propagation steps and then we're going to have what are called termination steps as we'll see and we'll see one exception to this with hbr and peroxide with hbr and peroxide we're going to find out that there are two initiation steps in that free radical reaction and keep in mind that's not a substitution though that's a free radical addition the addition of hbr uh, anti-markovnikov in the presence of peroxide so uh, but most of the time for these free radical halogenations outside of that one they're going to have a single initiation followed by two propagation steps where the product is produced over and over and over again and the idea is what we do is we don't hit this with a ton of light here we actually hit it with a fairly low intensity beam because we don't want to turn all the cl2 into cl radicals because we need cl2 for that second propagation step in fact you want to keep the concentration of radicals fairly low because if the concentration of radicals gets too low they might bump into each other and when two radicals bump into each other well one thing they 
can do is just the reverse of our initiation step. So, and so one thing that could happen is just you could have two chlorine radicals bumping into each other to form Cl2. And if them breaking apart is 243 kilojoules, then the delta H for when they come together, we shouldn't be surprised if it's negative. 243 kilojoules. <clears throat> and the problem is that this kills two chlorine radicals. And when, if we're killing, and i.e. lowering the concentration of radicals, well then less propagation is going to happen. And so if you use so much light that you get a high concentration of radicals, it's a waste because a lot of those radicals are just going to bump into each other and never get a chance to react anyways. And so we actually use a limited amount of light to keep the concentration of reactants, uh, I should say reactant uh, radicals low, so they don't bump into each other. Now, it turns out this is what we call a termination step. And anything that is the concentration of radicals could be a termination step. And you notice the, the hallmark of a termination step is you start off with two radicals and you end up with none. And so you go from two radicals to none, that's a decrease in the overall number of radicals. And it turns out it's just to look at the different radicals that exist somewhere along the way in your mechanism. And if any two of them meet, that's a termination step. So if you notice the other option here is we got not only a chlorine radical somewhere in the mechanism in a couple of places, but we've got this methyl radical that shows up in the mechanism as well. And so one of the other options we could have happen is we could just have a couple of methyl radicals meet. And this has served its purpose. I'm going to get rid of it. So, but we could just have a couple of methyl radicals meet as well. In which case we'd form a little bit of ethane. So, and I've got the delta H on your hand out there, but it should again be one a big negative number because all we're doing is forming a bond. And then finally, instead of two chlorine radicals meeting or two methyl radicals meeting, you could have a chlorine and a methyl radical meet as well. Let's make sure I match this up with how I wrote it on your hand out there. The methyl first. And if you notice, this just so happens, this middle termination step to form another one of our product, the same thing as our product. But again, this is not where your, most of your product is formed. We'll form very little amounts of these, assuming we've done this correctly and do very little termination. But eventually, you know, you are gonna do some termination steps and the reaction will eventually end. But before that happens, the idea is that we'll keep repeating these propagation steps millions and billions and zillions of times to make more and more product in that second propagation step over and over and over again. And so we'll actually get very little of these termination products as compared to the actual product of the reaction producing that second propagation step. Cool. So in this case, we had three different termination reactions. So just the three different ways the two radicals present can meet. Two identical here, two identical here, or one of each here. In each case, forming a new bond, they're all exothermic. All right, so I wanna go back and focus on these propagation steps because here's how we're gonna explain why bromination is so much more selective than chlorination. And it really comes down to that fir first propagation step. If you look at the two propagation steps, one's slightly endothermic and one's fairly exothermic. The activation energy of that first one is 17 kilojoules. The activation energy of the second one is four kilojoules. So the second one here is faster and it's exothermic. So it's actually energetically favorable. It's gonna release energy along the way. But this first one here, it turns out for chlorination, in this case, it's just a little bit endothermic. And depending on the carbon hydrogen bond we break, depending on your reactant, those energies can be a little bit different. Sometimes this will be a, a, you know, a little bit endothermic. Sometimes it could be a little bit exothermic. It really depends. But the big difference is gonna be when we go to bromination. So here we formed a chlorine hydrogen bond right there and then broke a carbon hydrogen bond. And the difference between those two is what's gonna allow us to get our delta H. So, but if you use bromination, instead of making an HCl bond, we'd be making an HBr bond. And with bromine being bigger than chlorine, it's a longer bond, it's a weaker bond. And so when we make an HBr bond, it would release less energy. And as a result, instead of being a little exothermic or a little endothermic like this one, it actually is a fairly endothermic step in bromination. It is not energetically favorable. And as a result, it actually ends up with a much higher activation energy as well. And so bromination's like, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is not an energetically favorable reaction. If you're gonna do this, you better relegate to doing this mostly at the right location, at the best location. The location that's gonna end up with the most stable carbon radical and the lowest activation energy along the way. Whereas chlorination's like, well, you know, I mean, I guess it'll be a little more energetically favorable to go to like a tertiary than a secondary than a primary than a methyl, but you know, they're all not so bad. It's not so energetically unfavorable like it is with bromine. So, you know, just do them all. 
So, and that's kind of the idea here. So with bromination, it's a much more unfavorable step, that first propagation step. And so it's much more selective on which one happens. So just kind of the nature of, you know, reactant molecules having certain energies at certain temperatures and stuff like this, and which fraction will have enough to get over the activation energy barrier. Well, with a much larger activation energy, bromination becomes much more selective. All right, so here we've kind of drawn the steps of the mechanism out, but we haven't done any of the arrow pushing. And so now I wanna take a look back at that bromination of propane and work out the arrow pushing you're probably on the hook for as well. All right, so with the bromination of propane, again, bromination being very selective, we found out in the first lesson that it is primarily gonna happen at that more substituted secondary carbon, and we'll get very little of the substitution, the other substitution products that are possible. And so in this case, we want to look at that mechanism. We always start with an initiation step here. And in this case, just like with chlorination, first step is we're going to form a couple of bromine radicals. And this is going to take something to get this pro endothermic process going. And I'll use light, but it could be heat or peroxide as well. And if we look at the arrow pushing, though, we're just going to do homolytic cleavage of this bond. It's going to break homolytically, we say. We call that homolytically because both sides of that bond get the same thing. There's where the homo and homolytic comes from. They both get one electron to form two bromine radicals. And so it just takes a certain energy of light to do that. And we make sure to use light in just that energy range to accomplish this. And this is your, again, initiation step. I like to think that we've now got the radical party started. So, and once we've got radicals, it's now time to use them. And so in the next step, our bromine radical is gonna abstract a hydrogen from propane here. And so we're gonna form a new bond between bromine and hydrogen. And the way we draw that is one of the electrons in that bond is the one from the, the radical bromine. The other one is going to come from one of the electrons in this bond, the carbon hydrogen bond. The other one is going to go back on that carbon to form our carbon radical in this step. And so now we've formed an HBr bond and we've also formed a carbon radical. So a hallmark of a good propagation step is that you start with one radical, you end with one radical. There's no increase or decrease in the number of radicals. And then there'll also be the repeating steps that end up forming your product. So now that we form this carbon radical, that carbon radical is gonna react with another Br2 molecule. And again, when we use light in that first step, we don't wanna break up all the bromine molecules because we need most of them to do this. We only turn a small concentration of them into bromine radicals, but we still got plenty of Br2 left and we're now gonna form a bond to one of those bromines. And once again, we're gonna use, one of the electrons comes from the radical, but the other comes from one of the electrons in this bond. The other electron goes to the other bromine to form another bromine radical. And that's where our product is formed, right in that second propagation step. And, and then once again, we also form another bromine radical. And then that bromine radical is just gonna go track down another propane molecule to react with to form another carbon radical. And these two steps will just repeat over and over and over again. And again, the two steps that repeat over and over and over again to create your product, those are your propagation steps. Cool. And finally, every good party must come to an end. And that's when we terminate the reaction. And that's when any two radicals meet. In the course of the reaction, we've got bromine radicals and we've got carbon radicals. And two bromine radicals can meet, two carbon radicals can meet, or a bromine radical could bump into a carbon radical. Any of those is going to be a termination step. So we could have two bromine radicals meet. So in which case, we're just going to form a new bond. And we're gonna create that bond, half each from both of the radical electrons from the two bromines. Essentially, this is just the reverse of our initiation step. We could also have two of our carbon radicals meet. And once again, it works exactly the same way. We're gonna form our bond from one electron from the radicals on each side. And we'll form very little again of these products. So this is not a major way to create a product. Most of our product is again being produced in that second propagation step. And then finally, we could also have a carbon radical bump into a bromine radical. We'll create a new bond between carbon and bromine. And technically, this termination step will create a little bit of our actual 
product of the reaction as well. But again, most of your product's not being produced in termination steps, but in that second propagation. But any one of these that takes two radicals and turns into something with no radicals is going to decrease that concentration of radicals in our solution or in our mixture. So, and in this case, these are your termination steps. And if I haven't made this abundantly clear, your initiation step is typically going to start with no radicals to two radicals. So you're producing, you're getting increase in radicals, you're getting the radical party started, if you will. Your propagation steps are going to start with a radical and end with a radical. Start with a radical, end with a radical, and have no change overall in the net concentration of radicals. And then your termination steps are going to take two radicals and turn into something with no radicals and lead to a net decrease in the overall concentration of radicals in your solution. And once again, if you have found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? A couple of the best things you can do to help support the channel. And if you're looking for the study guides or practice problems, if you're looking for practice final exams or final exam rapid reviews, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.